Okay, we're back. We're live. Four o'clock rock here on Think Tech. And we're doing a center stage. Uh, ordinarily, Donna Blanchard does this, but I am doing it today. <laughs> With Simon Crookall, and he's the general director of Hawaii Opera Theater. Uh, and we're entitling this, I Always Cry at Lava Wham. That's a personal reference. <laughs> I well, always. me too. Me too, <laughs> okay. actually. Yeah. Welcome sad. to the show. Simon. Thank you, Jay. So nice Good to, to be back. Yeah. Good to be back. So, I mean, big news. The, the opera season begins with Lava Wham. Begins on Friday. A yes. Friday this week, a couple of days away. Yes. It's so exciting. And what a, great, what a great opening. What a great start. Yes. One of the most popular operas ever written. Uh, still beloved uh, over 100 years. And also, of course, been turned into many other versions. Yeah. The Broadway musical Rent is, a, yeah. is an update yeah. of La Boheme. Yeah. The music isn't quite so pretty, but yeah. uh, in my opinion. But uh, a, a timeless story and, and beautiful music, and we've brought in a, a wonderful production from Opera St. Louis, mm -hmm. uh, which makes it look uh, extremely attractive, too. Ah, well, I can hardly wait. We, my wife and I go on Sunday afternoons and this one, I, I relish. I sit there and I, I let it flow all over me. Yes. You know, in fact, I was telling you, last night, I, you know, in preparation for this show, I was looking at some of the YouTube um, you know, videos on this opera, and my wife couldn't understand it. I was playing them over and over and over again. And the one that touched me most was um, with uh, Anna... Netrebko. Netrebko. Yes. The Russian, the Russian name, soprano. I guess. Yes. Yeah. And uh, her uh, her lead male was um, um, it's coming to me. Um, Al Alvarez. Alvarez. She said Mikhail Alvarez. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the two of them were so perfectly matched. Mm -hmm. And she uh, Anna is beautiful beyond description. I mean, as a well, we don't have Anna Netrebko, but we do have Elizabeth Caballero, uh -huh. who was here last time for uh, Pagliacci. She mm -hmm. sang Neda ah. and Pagliacci. You and, have your old uh, friends. You bring back. Well, we've brought back a few this time, actually. Yeah. Uh, Musetta is Rachel Durkin, who sang with us in Midsummer Night's Dream uh -huh. in February. And uh, the Colline is Nate Stark, who was bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream, so a slightly different role for him. Uh, so it's nice to be able to bring people back, and, and, and some new people too. Uh, yeah. So Mac Whitney, who's the Rodolfo, is new to us, and very young, and extremely talented. Beautiful voice. So, you know, I don't think people fully understand that you tap into a global system of opera stars. Sure. They can be from anywhere, performing anywhere, um, and you find them through your special networks, Right. And you bring them to Hawaii. And what's wonderful is, and, and we've been talking to the cast about this this time, is that each time they come together as a new set of people. Sure. And they have to make the relationships and the chemistry uh, in three short weeks of rehearsal. Uh, Wes Mason, who's singing Marcello for us, said, if you saw them at a bar, these guys, you'd think that they all hung out together. They were friends. <laughs> they were dating each other. They, they are all of a similar age and, and very talented. But they all get on extremely well together. And you never actually know that until they arrive at the rehearsal hall and day one starts and you see the chemistry building in front of you. Chemistry. And that's part, very of the, that's part of the, the special elixir of, yeah. of this opera. Yeah, because you know, no matter how well people sing, yeah. I was just at an opera at a very uh, famous opera house uh, where the tenor was superb and the soprano was superb, but there was absolutely no chemistry between them. And so by the end, when, of course, inevitably they die, uh, you didn't really care that much. Yeah. In this opera, I always cry at Bohem, yeah. uh, I, I think you will cry very much because Mimi has such a, a gentle and beautiful death and sorry we're doing a spoiler now folks but um but and she does it so lyrically and so beautifully she just slips away it's gorgeous i envy you the opportunity to see the rehearsals and yes and yes that's, feel, feel that's that. the great part about my job i yeah, get to really. see them <laughs> i envy see that, them working yeah. every day so uh, give give our listeners a précis on the uh, on the plot there for a yeah time. so the opera set in paris uh in the mid 19th century uh, Bohem refers to the fact that they are Bohemians. Uh, they're living in an attic. They're poor as church mice. And uh, there are four guys together, uh, Rudolfo the poet, Marcello the painter, um, Shona the musician, and Colline, who's a philosopher. So great pals. They live in squalor and, and misery. 
Uh, and into their lives comes this beautiful girl, Mimi, who uh, immediately falls madly in love with Rodolfo, and the feeling is mutual. Um, it's it's she, all in the same act, the same scene. That all happens in Act One. The, yeah. the, 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 <laughs> there's one aria to the effect, my name is Mimi, yes. and ten minutes later, the two of them are swearing eternal love in, yes. those, was it suave? But, but in this one, actually, you can, you can see why, because... He is immediately smitten by her when she comes in. Yeah. She takes a little warming up, but she gets there. Yeah. And uh, by the end, you know, they decide to go out to the cafe with, with his friends. And he says, what will we do afterwards? And she said, well, let's see. <laughs> so, you know, already they're making plans. So it's a good first date. Um, second act is in the cafe, Cafe Momu. And it's Christmas Eve in Paris. So lots of fun and excitement. The chorus is center stage for act two. Uh, and we in Hawaii are very lucky that we have this amazing uh, volunteer chorus, tremendously talented, yeah. They're always the highlight of any production, yeah. and the Hawaii Youth Opera Chorus, uh, who are also starring in this production Oh, both. Too. Terrific. So we get the kids running in and out and singing their heads off. It's wonderful. And we get to meet Musetta. We met, meet Musetta, really who's a bit stuff. of a coquette. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> She's, uh, she has had uh, an affair with Marcello, the painter. But she's now uh, being escorted by Alcindoro, who is a lot better off than Marcello. Uh, but when they come to the cafe, she, I think, realizes that actually Marcello is a little more fun. <laughs> so she sings her great uh, waltz song and attracts Marcello's attention again. And uh, the, the uh, escort, the rich escort, is pushed out of the way after he's paid the bill. He pays the bill for everybody in the, in the group. <laughs> Uh, so that's Act 2. and then it's in like the Millennials. Yeah, oh, they are Millennials. This, yes, Absolutely. they are Millennials. They they're living on the edge. Appeal to the Millennials. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, I mean, they're, they're a really... And our guys, they're not quite in the early 20s, although, although um, Mac is, I think, mid-20s. Yeah. Uh, they're all in the early yeah. part of their life, which is great. so much fun. And they do have a lot of fun. <laughs> Act 3 is where it starts to get a little more uh, melancholy. Uh, we see... Uh, Musetta, uh, sorry, we see Mimi come in. Uh, by this time, her, her uh, illness is getting worse. Uh, she actually has uh, consumption, or as we now call it, tuberculosis. And uh, she tells Marcello that uh, Rodolfo is trying to push her away. She then hides in the corner while, Ma while Rodolfo comes out and tells Marcello actually the reason he's pushing her away is that he's worried about her health. He thinks that living in the frozen garret is actually making her iller. Yeah. So uh, Mimi comes out again and they have this beautiful duet uh, where they start to reconcile and they say there's no point in, in splitting up during the winter. Uh, we will stay together till the spring. Meanwhile, Marcello and Mazzetta are having a rare old fight in the corner. Uh, they do decide to split up. Um, and then we move into Act 4. In the original script, there was a, th a fourth act in between what we now know as Act 3 and Act 4, where we saw a little more of the character of uh, Musetta and the character of Mimi, and uh, they have a big party, and Mimi is flirting with one of the richer gentlemen, and Rudolfo gets crossed. Sorry, that's between Act 2 and 3. So uh, by the time we get to Act 4, the boys are back in the garret, uh, the girls have both gone their separate ways, and we have a kind of jolly start. Uh, now you're seeing the uh, the Café Momu. This is the, mm -hmm. the second act mm -hmm. uh, scene. Mm -hmm. But in Act 4, uh, Mimi uh, and Musetta come into the garret. Mimi's very ill. Uh, she's coughing. She's obviously not got long for this world. And sadly, as they all gather around her to try and comfort her, she slips away. So, so touching. At that point, oh. handkerchiefs in hand oh, because yeah. it is very sad. And if if you know, you know how it's yes, going to end exactly. up. The whole the whole opera <laughs> yes. is you know it's, so yeah. touching. Well, you know, this was one of the very first uh, operas called Opera Verismo. Uh, after all of the the Verdian tradition and the Wagner's, 
of these big operas about gods and goddesses, kings and queens, grand figures. Epical stuff. Uh, yes, the, the Italian tradition moved to something called verismo, truth in opera and truth in, in theater. And so uh, this is about real people living real lives, having real illnesses, and and it is possible to associate to associate yourself with the people you see yeah, on yes stage. And that that tradition is now carried on into the twenty first century. The, the tape I was telling you I was watching last night at the end of that the particular aria in the first act where they swear love to each other. It's mm -hmm. so touching that, that they, the players on the stage in the opera house they kiss. I mean, it's a major kiss now. This is a ro as romantic as it gets. Yes. And then, then, you know, the camera goes to the B-roll of the audience watching this, and you see people in the audience grabbing each other and kissing. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> well, well, there's a hint to our audience. Yeah. We'll see what yeah. happens. So, so if you go to see La Boheme, it's okay. <laughs> Reach it's over okay to, to your date and give her a big smooch. It's okay to cry. It's okay <laughs> it's to okay kiss. It's okay to cry. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. I always do. <laughs> So where does this fit in Puccini's work, and where does it fit in opera in general? So it's, uh, as I said, the middle of the 19th century. Um, Puccini had written, he started out by writing an opera for a competition. Uh, he didn't even get placed in the competition. It was called Le Villi, uh, not a great success. And then he wrote an opera called Edgar, and that wasn't a success either at the theater, uh, but Ricordi, the publisher, heard it and decided he wanted to uh, champion Puccini. Ricordi had this great deal going when he published music, and he still, we're using Ricordi scores for this production. Um, when he was putting on, when opera houses called him to put on a, a big opera by Verdi, Aida, Trovatore, one of the, the big operas, he would only let them rent uh, Aida or Trovatore if they rented another opera by one of his less known composers. <laughs> so Puccini got in on the back of Verdi ah, on a number of occasions. So this was his fourth opera. After, after uh, Edgar, he wrote Manon Lescaut, mm -hmm. which was a very big success. Yeah. And then uh, La Boheme. And it was an interesting time because there were two composers working on the same story at the same time. Uh, Leon Cavallo, who then later wrote Pagliacci, uh, was writing a Labo M2, and not Labo M2, also. Another Labo, Labo M, also, M yeah. yeah. And so uh, they had a bit of a dust up in a cafe in Paris, uh, no, in Milano, sorry, where um, Leon Cavallo said, You've stolen my idea. And um, Puccini said, Well, let's see how the public view it. <laughs> and of course, Leon Cavallo's opera came out, was immediately successful but then disappeared and Puccini is still being played a hundred years later. Yeah. So um, that's, uh, that's yeah, that really uh, where Puccini something. came in. And then of course he went on to write uh, Madame Butterfly and uh, Turandot and all of the all other All some of the big most Tosca, favorite operas big, in the yes, world. Exactly. Yeah, she's and still, a success. And you know, it's, Puccini is an interesting character because when he s was writing, the critics were very snoo sniffy about what he wrote. Uh, they didn't think that it was uh, deeply uh, intellectual music. It was too much on the surface. It was too emotional. Uh, they uh, said that he wasn't the kind of composer that Mozart or Verdi or Wagner were. Uh, but of course, the public has, has thought otherwise. And Debussy in particular got very upset uh, with Puccini because he said, why has this Italian composer chosen a French theme for his opera? How, what do Italians know about France and Paris and the, uh, you know, they the know about Hall. love. Well, <laughs> yes, but he was, he was not happy. He said, he said, when Puccini writes music, he makes an Italian noise and not a French one. So uh, there's quite a lot of rivalry at the time about, about what they were so doing. So many stories in this yes, area. Yes, yes, exactly. And it makes it so rich and rewarding. Let's take a short break. When we come back, uh, I'd like Simon Crookall to tell us about where this opera fits in the season altogether. What, four operas this season? Yeah. And uh, we'll see how it plays out. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I host the show Center Stage on Think Tech Wednesdays at 2 p.m. And this is Crystal That's Quark. right. I'm Crystal, and I host Quark Talk on Tuesday mornings. <laughs> I like watching Donna's show. 
<laughs> you do. I like watching your show. I like watching your show because you talk about you're not afraid to really dive into issues that are important and and sometimes they're a little shocking and you always bring us information that is sometimes the underbelly that we Ooh, need to know and we need to you. see. It's important. Well said. Well, I like yours because you can find any topic and any type of character, but you will find that source which brought them to the product of that creative process and I thought that's like the most important thing is the process awesome right? I think yeah I do I think it's all about the process and I think we'll find world peace when we know each other's stories so thank you very much for bringing that to us join thank us you. on think tech <laughs> think tech Hawaii anytime <laughs> I'm getting so excited about the opera opening on Friday and I get to see it on Sunday and I want to go to the lecture they give I'd be able to really understand it after this discussion. They give a lecture on the Lanai uh, and right. the other yes. side of the Opera House. And, I, Lynn Johnson. and I get Lynn Johnson, I get to watch that, and then I go inside. Yeah. So I'm really ready, and I'm totally ready for this one, Simon. Uh -huh. So uh, let's look at some photos, and we'll talk about which one relates to which opera in the season coming now. Okay, what's that? So this is opening act of La Boheme. Mm -hmm. uh, these uh, photographs are taken at the dress rehearsal last night. So this is the opening act in the garret. You can see the window. You can see Marcello painting. And uh, Rodolfo scribbling away at the table. That's really a garret. The bricks are coming off the wall. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, this is Rodolfo and Mimi when they first meet. Uh -huh. And the moon is shining brightly. The moon. You have that moon? This is on the stage, a moon like that? It's not the, uh, not the, the moon itself, you understand. Oh, pardon me. Uh, this is act two, uh, which is the Café Momu. Uh, the lit oh, lanterns and everybody, the, st uh, the stage is full of chorus and children and everybody else. It's a, it's a great, uh, great scene. Yeah. Yes, here's from last night okay. uh, with the lit windows and uh, Musetta is having her, her day uh, in the middle there. Uh, lovely. More. Yep, and here's more. Uh, there's a character called Papignon who's the toy seller. And he comes out and the kids all run out after him. This is one of the, the photographs taken at the back of the booth. This is actually somebody else's production. The color ones are ours. Mm -hmm. And this is the one from, here we are, here's ours ah. again. Uh, this is act three, uh, Rodolfo and Marcello, uh, and Mimi is hiding in the corner. You can just see her yes. on the left of the picture. There. Yes. Yeah. It feels cold. It is cold. <laughs> and the snow falling all through this. Oh, but of course, you know, for our characters, it's a little unfortunate because they have to all get dressed up in their <laughs> coats and scarves and they're sweltering <laughs> on stage in Hawaii. Uh, this is back to Act Four. Oh, here's another photograph. Uh, this is a, a family group, obviously, from the this, That's from the, the street cafe. scene. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's this Oh, now? and more photographs. This is actually, yes. Yeah, so this production is quite interesting. It has been started out in Opera St. Louis. It's traveling around the country. And each place, uh, it has slightly different treatments. So this is the treatment they gave it in Seattle. They uh, timed the production to uh, the start of photography in, uh, in Paris, mm -hmm. the beginning of the century. Uh, so you see some pretty well-known photographs there. Okay, now we're, oh, what's that one now? Now this is Bohème, but it's not our Bohème. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who that one is. <laughs> this is. You can see the Eiffel Tower in the back. Uh, but it's not a not an okay. HOT bone. Let's move to the next one. Oh, I tell you what this is. I'm sorry. We're now in three Decembers. This is our three Decembers. opera in uh, in March. What was the previous uh, one? Let's go back to the previous one. Yeah, that must one. be. That was three Decembers also. Yeah. It must be. Yes. The same. The same this player. is uh, Frederica von Stade, mm -hmm. the uh, extremely well-known uh, opera singer, who is coming to Hawaii to recreate a role that she uh, made in 2008 ah. uh, in Houston. And this is a story of Madeline Mitchell, an actress who, it's, uh, um, who is coming to the end of her career. And she has a, a son and a daughter. And uh, each year at Christmas, she writes a, a family letter and tells everybody about what she's been doing in the previous year. Um, and this is a fairly dysfunctional family. So the kids call each other up and and a bitch about their mum, basically. She's always put her career in front of her children. And so uh, it's quite a kind of family drama. This one is going to be uh, one act. It's only 90 minutes. We're doing it for the first time at Hawaii Theatre uh, in downtown Honolulu. Mm -hmm. uh, we usually perform, of course, at the Blaisdell. Mm -hmm. So this one's at the Hawaii Theatre. And then we're taking it to 
uh, the Big Island, to Kauai, Great. and to Maui. Glad you're doing it. This is a more ever. mobile op uh, opera then. It's a smaller uh, okay. production. It's yeah. only three singers, ten musicians. Uh, and it's able to be traveled uh, around. But it's the first time we've ever performed opera on the Big Island or Kauai. Uh, it'll be our third time at the MAC in, uh, in Maui. That's so great. Very excited about Glad that. Glad you're doing that. Yeah, that's, that's going to be great. In between those two, uh, we're doing uh, Streetcar Named Desire, which, of course, uh, here we are. Uh, it's the Tennessee Williams uh, play, which was made into a, a film famously with Marlon Brando and mm -hmm. Vivian Lee. Yep. Um, this is the opera version which Andre Previn, uh, the very well-known conductor and composer, yeah. wrote. And uh, is the, here we are, here's oh. the, the scene playing cards. You can uh, see the emotive power of the cards. Exactly. Here. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, well, everybody knows about Blanche Dubois and all of that. Um, <laughs> it's a great story. And uh, actually, it would be a good thing to check out the film, the movie, before <laughs> you come. Yeah. Uh, but ah, it's yes, a, here we are, here's Stanley. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, emotional, it's a great subject for an opera, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so here More they are. More of the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a great, uh, great opera and a new piece for us yeah. and for Hawaii. Good for you for taking, yeah. for taking it to so, another level. Yeah, this year 50% of the composers of Hawaii Opera Theatre are alive and American. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> but it shows you, doesn't it, Simon, that opera is alive and well. Of course. Opera, opera can yeah. be made into something that's relevant right now Being today. Being written all the time. And, and, you know, I think when we're growing new audiences and we're really working hard at growing younger audiences for the opera, to see something that they can relate to on stage is, is really important. Yeah. So uh, it's good to have the real everyday stories that, that we can... How about Hoffman now, Tales of Hoffman? So the end of the season, Tales of Hoffman. Uh, this is a big, and you can see there, th those are sketches for the production. It hasn't been built yet. It's a new production for Hawaii uh, by Peter Dean Beck, who's our Oh, he's been around the designer. Hawaii Opera Theater forever. I know, yeah. and he's so good. Um, Out of New York still? Yes, yes. Uh, he flies in for the shows. So Hoffman is a poet. Uh, we start and end the opera in the, in the inn where he's drinking and bewailing the fact that somehow he can never quite get the girl. <laughs> and he has a series, then we see a series of, uh, of scenes of the girls that he doesn't quite get. Uh, one is, turns out to be a, uh, a very attractive uh, woman who is in reality a mechanical doll. Uh, one is uh, a singer who collapses while she's singing to him. One is a courtesan. He believes her to be pure, but she's not. And uh, he, in the end of the opera, he finally decides that, okay, uh, he needs to dedicate himself to his poetic muse <laughs> instead of chasing after these women. So it's a big, grand opera. There's lots of uh, music that everybody knows. It's uh, by Offenbach. Uh, so again, French, real French this time. Yeah. Uh, but a, a big, uh, grand production. And Henry Aquinas directing that one. Ah, terrific. Terrific. Yeah. See, there's talent at HOT. Oh, yes, We definitely. can direct our own operas. We have we players can build come the locally. Sets. We can do the, you yeah, know, We're exactly. a serious house here. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, how is opera in Hawaii? Uh, I want it to be everywhere. I want it to be at every elementary school. Uh, are well, kids picking up on it? Are they coming uh, forward with it? I think so. So, you know, obviously, opera in Hawaii is, is in itself a miracle. Uh, everything is brought in from somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, this actually this time with the set coming from St. Louis, the costumes coming from Arizona, everything actually arrived on time. That's not always the case. <laughs> uh, but this time we've been fine. Um, so audiences are holding firm. Uh, obviously, the traditional audience is a little uh, more mature, let's say, than the average population. Yeah, that's but true. we are growing very uh, quickly in the younger audience. We now have, of course, H-O-T, HOT, is the best acronym you could possibly wish for. <laughs> really? And we now have a, an event on Tuesday nights at the performance called HOT Tuesday. We do a pre-party at the Honolulu Club, and it's aimed at young professionals and millennials and everybody else. Uh, they come for a drink and uh, a few poo-poo, and then they come across to the show. And we're now getting about 150 uh, people to those, which is great. Um, and the show means there's a performance. Oh, yeah, they come across to the Tuesday performance of the, of the, of the opera. Um, but we're also working uh, across the, the state with schools everywhere we go. Uh, last year, we did 74 performances of 
uh, school version of Magic Flute, uh, and that travels to all the islands. Um, it's uh, 35 minutes long. We have three singers and a piano and a very basic set. And we send to the schools in advance a big information pack, a teacher's pack, so they can learn about the opera, they can learn some of the songs. Uh, this year, the opera we're doing is Hansel and Gretel, uh, which Perfect. is the two children in the wood and the witch that turns children into gingerbread. Uh -huh. So the school pack, of course, has a recipe for gingerbread men, apart from yeah, anything yeah. else. Um, but the, the children are prepared for it. Tomorrow night, uh, we'll be doing our second dress rehearsal, and we always open that up to middle and high school children, so students. So uh, we will have just over a 1,000 uh, kids in uh, enjoying the opera. And of course, the response that they give to the singers is completely different, uh, very much more emotive. They cheer when the heroes come. They boo for the villains. Right in the middle of the aria. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> My favorite was last year when we did Magic Flute, and Papageno, the bird catcher, comes on and he's very upset because he can't uh, find a wife. And he comes onto the stage and he sings this way. He says, uh, I will count to three. And if anybody wants me, just say. Uh, oh, and of course, nobody does because it's an opera. So he counts one and he counts two. And he's about to sling his noose over the tree. And this little voice from the back says, I love you, Papageno. <laughs> and he was completely thrown. He didn't know what to do in that circumstance. Because it doesn't happen. No. So that was hilarious. No, they really get involved. Uh, so that's our other uh, school program. And then we do uh, what we call opera residences, where we go into schools and actually help the kids to put on their own opera. So we're doing five schools this year. Some of them are operas that have already been written and have been abridged by our team. Mm -hmm. Some of them are operas that they write themselves. So last year in Waikali, uh, we did Waikali Elementary. The, the children wrote an opera based on the D.A.R.E. program, which is Drug Abuse Resistance uh -huh. Education. So it's a program of HPD. Uh -huh. And the children wrote their own scenarios. And then our guys set them to popular tunes from Carmen and Boehm. Ah, and all ah those wonderful. And then they, they performed them for their colleagues and classmates and everybody. The police were delighted uh, to make an opera out of, uh, out of Dare. Uh, but very often they will write stories or scenarios. And this was about, you know, uh, the kid who goes home and invites his friends around and they bring beer and they all get drunk and this is terrible and, you know, how you resist that kind of pre Perfect. pressure. Perfect. So there's a lesson in there. Exactly. And they're engagement. singing it so it goes into their heads. Sure, sure. Kids so, remember those things. Yeah. So that's a, a much more in-depth program, we usually work for a whole semester with the children. You're cutting edge here, Simon. Is this, now is what is happening with HOT in Hawaii happening on the mainland? Or are you cutting edge beyond it what is, you I think. I think more and more uh, in terms of repertoire, people are looking towards the modern repertoire uh, to try and grow audiences. In terms of education, we have a very well developed program. I mm -hmm. mean, not all opera companies have that kind of depth of education. And you know we're reaching something like 22,000 uh, students a year. So uh, what's good about our program is that we have the, the um, you know the long the, the kind of broad sweep of all the schools that we go to, with Hansel and Gretel or Magic Flute. We have the in-depth uh, learning that we do when we're putting on productions, and then we have the opportunity to see the main stage. So there are all levels of, of education going on. So the thing I would ask you last is, as, as a general manager of this fantastic enterprise, there must be huge gratification for you. Of course. Not only in the daily process of organizing it and watching it come alive, you know, in the rehearsal and all that, but in seeing it perform. How do you feel about that? Where does it fit in your life? Oh, I've always loved opera. I mean, you know, I spent the last 20 years of my career before coming here working for symphony orchestras, which I love too, but I always, always wanted to get into opera. And there's nothing like the thrill of being there in the theater when, when the opera is going full tilt. And you've got the visual, you've got the oral, you've got the emotional, all happening at the same time. So this is, yes, this is definitely my passion, and it's what I've been working my whole life to get That's to. That's great. So great I'm to very have happy. you in the community, to have H O D. I'm a lucky man. Yes, you are. And we're lucky to be able to talk to you. Now, if I wanted to get a ticket to Lava Wham or the season, yes. how would I do that? Best place is hawaiiopera.org. Uh, on the website, or you can call the box office, 596-7858. Uh, performances on Friday 14th, 
uh, Sunday 16th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and Tuesday 18th at 7 p.m. So there's still Thank a few you, tickets Simon. left. So when, is it that we're not going to sing at the end of the show here? If you want to <laughs> oh, you sing and me? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take your lead on it. <laughs> I, think, I think we better let them wait okay. for the, for next, the real next thing. Okay, next time we'll sing. <laughs>